Hello and welcome to the Thursday Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and sitting across the table from me is a man who knows an awful lot more about the Africa Cup of Nations 2017 than he did yesterday. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. Why learn something over a long period of time when you can learn it all at once in like a two-hour period? <laughs> I mean, that's an exaggeration, but yeah. not by much. No, it's, but not by much. While I was watching uh, the Ghana-Egypt game, I was researching about everything else that's happened in the African Cup of Nations <laughs> because I was preparing to do an interview, which you'll hear later on. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, for those who haven't been paying attention, Africa Cup of Nations 2017 is happening in Gabon. Mm-hmm. The group stage is over. The quarterfinals start this weekend. Mm-hmm. We've had a few t- tweets. We've had a few emails. People mm-hmm. saying, hey, are you guys going to follow this tournament? Yep. And the answer is yes, but it's kind of my fault because I was down in Florida um, and a bit distracted. <laughs> Shake your head at me. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, this is us um, catching up with the Africa Cup of Nations Mm-hmm. getting ourselves caught up, not pretending to be experts, but we've done some research, we've figured yeah. some things out, mm-hmm. and we spoke to a special guest who you'll hear from very soon. Taylor, please, could you tell our listeners who the special guest is and mm-hmm. uh, why they were chosen? Sure. <laughs> uh, our special guest was uh, Tim Orlay. He writes for the Africa Report. He's covering it at the African Cup of Nations for that publication. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, it's because I was looking at journalists who were covering the tournament, who were doing a good job. Um, and I know he's been rolling with Jonathan Wilson, who we've yeah. had on the show before. Um, but it seemed, I really liked his coverage. He's hosting the, uh, the Kafka-esque podcast yes. that they're all doing. And uh, just everyone take a second to appreciate appreciate yep. that pun. It's spelled mm-hmm. C-A-F, mm-hmm. like Confederation of African Football. Right. But then also, uh, I think K-A or C-A, I'm not sure how they did it, but it's a pun on Kafka. Right. The writer who wrote about like surreal, totalitarian stuff, what the trial, the mm-hmm. castle, metamorphosis, I yep. believe is the one Turning you, into a cockroach. you called out. I'm not mm-hmm. sure how that is involved. But I'm not sure either. I don't think it fits really. <laughs> but I basically, I just love the pun on that podcast. Is it that one of these teams can never die? There it is. <laughs> there it is. Much like cockroaches. But, yeah. Um, just to, to plug their podcast a little bit, it's essentially, mm-hmm. um, it's four, I want to say, British journalists. Four, sometimes five, yeah. Four, sometimes five British journalists in Africa, and they're, do, you know, they're covering the tournament. It seems like at the end of the day, mm-hmm. they all just gather around the table in the room they're renting, and they all just talk about their day. It's, it's essentially, how was your day, dear? But it's really interesting. Well, I appreciate that sometimes <laughs> it's like they let you know the situation, so sometimes it's like, we've just eaten a ridiculously expensive French meal, and now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> you do get the vibe that it's occasionally after a couple drinks that yeah, they yeah. like. They're sitting around having, having a few drinks and talking about the day. Right, yeah. it's kind of like non-professional the podcast but the people doing it are very professional so yeah. it's this nice sort of uh, balance which I think it's like 15 minutes yeah. long as well, so which I think it kind of fits with the uh, African combinations as a whole because it is sort of like kind of it seems like a little bit chaotic in terms of scheduling in terms oh, yeah. of what's happening on the ground so you've got kind of you've got to kind of roll with it a little bit uh-huh. and it seems like that's what they're doing <laughs> mm-hmm. alright so let's play your interview with Temo Olay mm-hmm. and then we'll come back afterwards and maybe we'll build on what he said because he didn't have that long to talk as I understand it mm-hmm. And that's actually kind of my fault because I emailed him last night to say, like, the earlier the better, forgetting that there's the six-hour time difference. So then he emailed me back at, like, 3.30 in the morning, my time, being like, I'm ready to go now if you're available. And I was not. But I was at about 10.30 in the morning, my time, and that's when we did the interview. So I've heard the interview. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tamo gives us a, does a really good job of sort of giving a broad overview of what's happened so right. far. So I thought the way we can do this, we can play this for our listeners, then we'll come back, then we'll pick up on some of the things he said with the research we've done to follow up. All right, here's Taylor talking to Tamo Lay. Joining me now, I've got uh, Tamor Lay uh, reporting on the African Cup of Nations for the Africa Report. Tamor, thank you so much for uh, taking time to uh, join me today. No problem. Greetings from Libreville. It's currently pouring down with rain, but it's still very hot. <laughs> that sounds about right. And that sounds like it's been pretty consistent. I've listened to a few of your, uh, is it Kafka-esque, the show that you all are doing there, uh, reporting on the uh, tournament? Yeah, that's a podcast. It's a group of kind of four British mm-hmm. journalists who do this tournament pretty regularly and we're staying in a flat in Libreville so we thought we'd spend our evenings talking about what is you know a fascinating tournament both football wise and off the pitch. Yeah and that's actually kind of what I wanted to start with was about the off the pitch uh, incidents or, or kind of conditions there because while it's been an interesting tournament it seems like there's been some stuff behind the scenes that's been pretty interesting from the kind of culture there where you've been in some towns that it sounds like they're like kind of oil boom towns where there's not much going on and so that's a little strange but then also from the uh, it sounds like there's been some not necessarily unrest but it sounds like uh, the Gabon national team is not the most popular of teams even though it's being played in the Gabon. Yeah, I mean, the reason the timing of the tournament isn't great for the government is that there was a disputed election in the summer of 2016 
uh, where the president, um, Ali Bongo, whose father was in government for 40 years and, um, and then his son took over, um, won by, well, they say 6,000 votes. So there were lots of protests on the streets and all sorts of things going on. So six months down the line, they're having, you know, they're, they're already committed to holding this tournament. But a lot of people are really unhappy, especially in Libreville, the capital. Mm -hmm. But it's a strange country, right? It's, it's a huge country. It's the size of Great Britain. Um, but it's only got two million people. It's 90 percent forest. Um, most of the world's gorillas and elephants are here, and but there's, there aren't that many people, and so they've built, you know, they've built these, you know, huge new stadiums mm -hmm. for high-level football. Um, but the infrastructure isn't really there. The pitches haven't been great. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether it's been a waste of money. So that's the atmosphere of the tournament is kind of kind of mixed. Yeah, and so that. Uh that kind of comes through a little bit that you all have had some debates about the crowd sizes and how well attended it's been. But that seems like it's kind of par for the course when it comes to the African Cup of Nations, just that it's not historically the most well attended tournament. Is that fair to say? It's tough. I mean, look, it's really expensive to travel mm -hmm. um, for African fans. If there are, you know, there's a huge Malian population in Gabon, so they all come out for their games. There were a lot of Ghanaians there last night um, in Port Gentil for their match with Egypt. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's pretty tough for fans to get here expense-wise. It's tough to get a visa, too, depending on the country. Um, so there were 1,800 um, at Tunisia v Zimbabwe. But the TV audience would have been huge, both in Tunisia and Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge amount of interest in this tournament in Africa. People really, really care about it. But, you know, you look, watch on the TV and there'll be loads of empty seats. But that doesn't really reflect how much, how important it is. Mm -hmm. No, that, make, that makes sense completely. Do you think the the maybe some of the lack of enthusiasm is also because it seems like a lot of the the bigger names when it comes to this tournament have underperformed? At least that's how I would characterize it. Because you have, what, at this point... Three of the top four most likely teams are the favorites in, in what, Algeria, the Gabon, and Ivory Coast have all been knocked out. Uh, so it's, it seems like it's been kind of a, uh, a surprising tournament, at least, as we enter the, uh, the quarterfinals. Yeah, that's an issue. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's partly the pitches that haven't helped the best players. So Mahrez played really well for Algeria, but on bad pitches, and his teammates didn't, didn't catch up with him. Aubameyang for Gabon, was, he was actually poor uh, for, for most of the games. Um, for Ivory Coast, the Toure brothers have retired and Jovino is injured, so there's a little less stardust there. Um, but it is a really unpredictable tournament just because generally over the last 10 to 15 years, the quality of African football, I think, has improved in the sense that there's more teams who hit a minimum standard and can beat each other. Uh, but that's happening at the same time as there isn't a really one great African side, you know, like a Nigeria or mm. Cameroon or Egypt of the past. So in a sense, you've got to, you, it's a lot more unpredictable because anyone can be anyone. But that doesn't mean the quality overall in terms of um, what we might compare to what these players are achieving with their sides in Europe and elsewhere around the world is, 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 is matched. And so in ter looking at the teams that are left, uh, is it fair to say that Senegal are probably the favorites at this point? For those who don't know, it's Burkina Faso, Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal, Cameroon, and DR Congo, Ghana. So do you think Senegal yeah. or, or would be, if you had to put money down, would it be on Senegal? Oh, definitely Senegal. I mean, Alio Cisse, the manager, who's obviously part of the, the really great Senegal side of the early noughties, I mean, he's, he's, um, he's managing them really well. He's um, got a coherent, fluid side together. They've got Sadio Mane um, playing kind of up front and off, off the wing, scoring goals. They're solid at the back, and you do expect them to beat Cameroon. Um, but Egypt, I've been really impressed by Egypt. They're back in the Af African Cup of Nations after seven years out. And Mohamed Salah is just head and shoulders above everyone else at this tournament in terms of quality as a player. So they can grind, grind, grind and, and nick goals. And that's what, you know that's kind of how they won their previous Afghans too. So Egypt or Senegal, I think. Um, but uh, who knows? Who knows? And so in terms of maybe, at least in my mind, if I'm being fully honest, like some of the maybe the lesser known teams, I guess, would be teams like Burkina Faso, DR Congo, even Tunisia to some extent. So with those like maybe lesser known teams, if people are going to start watching and getting into the knockout round, who are some players that maybe they should keep their eye on? Who has kind of um, set the tournament light or been uh, of particular interest to you so far? Well, Alioui for Morocco scored one of the goals of the tournament. Uh, when they when they beat Ivory Coast, so 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 watch out for him. Um, the Tunisians, they really are a team that are grinding rather than um, a team of, of stars. Um, but Cameroon, again, I mean, people won't know uh, most of their players um, as compared with the past, um, and they definitely weren't fancy because they were relying on players who were unknown. But actually, they cohered as a unit in a way much better than they have in previous previous tournaments. 
Interesting. And so you are now, so where are you now? Are you in Libreville? We're in Libreville. We're just, just going to sort out flights. I mean, the African, the kind of organizers do are, are helping journalists out with flights around the country. So we're probably going to go to Franceville uh, for the first quarterfinals. Mm-hmm. That's for Senegal, Cameroon. Um, and then we'll see what we can do. Either either go to OEM for the next one or come back to Libreville. So we're, we're, we're kind of picking our games at this stage. And then I can't I can't pronounce it nearly as well as you all can. But is it is it Port Gentil? Port Gentil, yeah. And is that? It sounds like like you all were kind of speculating, and I think you were you were writing the same on Twitter that like Egypt maybe didn't want to win so they could get out of that city. Is it that? Is it that rough, or is it just that there's not much to do? Oh no, it's more the pitch. It's definitely the worst pitch. Ah, the there it is. France feels the best pitch, which is why the, why the games have been better there. Um, but yeah, it's the quality of the pitch in Pujanti. I mean, it's pretty isolated too. But um, yeah, that's that, that's the reason. Although there is talk that Cap might move might move that quarterfinal because they're so worried about the pitch. So we'll find out about that in the next twenty four hours. And so with the pitch, is it just that it's raining so much that it makes it difficult for for drainage issues, or is it just that maybe they're not as like well taken care of? What is the problem with the the fields themselves? Even even before even before the rain, actually, you could just just when a pitch is first laid, you know, when you it's done in strips, and then there's um, you can see you can see the gaps where it needs to be woven in and embedded. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just they haven't got enough time for it. So so already the pitch was just down in strips, and they're trying to fill in the gaps with grass shavings and dirt, and then as soon as the team start playing it cuts up and then on top of that we've had more rain than i think was anticipated um but it means just really like last night you know you know the the iu brothers and other people they're trying to play decent football on that pitch but you can just see the ball bobbling about really wildly and they're getting frustrated too um so actually last night could have been a sense it was a pretty good game the one nil egypt won with a salah free kick it was a good game but actually on a decent pitch that would have been a really great game because you could see there was intensity and intent there I know we got to get you uh, get you going here, but my one of my final questions, at least, was going to be: so, with that in mind, though, do you think then the team that can kind of play the most pragmatic like football and get kind of used to the conditions is the one that's most likely to win, or do you think it is still going to come down to the technique and the talent as well as the ability to be a little bit pragmatic? Well, I mean, pragmatism is kind of known to prevail at Afcons. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so a team like Tunisia, who, who actually they've been surprisingly entertaining in this tournament, you can't count you know, against them because if you do, if you do keep clean sheets, you you can nick things. Um, so, I would hope that a bit of progressive ambition will prevail, and if that does happen, then Senegal are the best bet. Excellent. And then my final question, and then I'll let you go, I promise. Um, uh, Daryl, my co-host, and I, Daryl's from Birmingham, England, by the way, so we've got the, the UK-American okay. combination. Um, we've discussed going to uh, AFCON before. We thought about going to this one, actually, but we're very strongly leaning towards the 2019 uh, tournament in the Cameroon. You've, yeah. I, I don't know if you've covered these before. I think you covered the one in Equatorial Guinea. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, I went to Equatorial Guinea. Is that is was that something you would you recommend going to these tournaments? Is it a pretty interesting experience? It sounds like it's a little bit kind of chaotic in terms of like, oh, we're going here now. Oh, wait, now we're moving here. They might change this, but it seems like overall it's a fairly enjoyable experience. Oh yeah, and part of the fun is getting places. I mean, we we took a you know fourteen hour train from Libreville to Franceville through the jungle. Uh, there's crazy flights, um, airstrips, boats, catamarans. Uh, and they're actually at the tournament. There are a few kind of tourists who come. I, I keep meeting German groundhoppers for some reason um, who, who make the effort. I mean, just for Gabon, it's really expensive because mm-hmm. it's an oil economy and inflation's really high. But Cameroon, for example, in 2019, that's going to be like the perfect tournament, I think, for lots more people to come out and watch. Um, and actually for, for neighboring African countries as well, for actually people to cross the border by road easily and cheaply. So I think there'll be big... And it's a football country, right? So I think Cameroon will definitely be the tournament if you ever... I've ever thought of coming to an Afghan. I think Cameroon will be a great one. So and Ivory Coast is 2021. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. And Guinea, and Guinea is the next one. So they're all laid out already. Oh, excellent. So I just need to learn French really quickly then. Or I got two years, I guess. Oh. I'm too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, uh, Tim Worley, thank you so much for joining, uh, joining me today. If people want to read more from you, find out more about your coverage, uh, how can they do so? Oh, uh, go to theafricareport.com or follow our podcast, Kafkaesque, which is on SoundCloud. Give it Google, you'll find it. It is. It's great. I enjoy hearing all like the street noise and like the car driving by. <laughs> <laughs> it always makes me laugh. Uh, but thank you very much. I know you've got a, a busy schedule, so I appreciate you taking the time. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you again to Tamar Lay for coming on the show. Very much appreciated. Uh, we're going to talk more African Cup of Nations in just a second. But first, a word from today's sponsor. 
First of all, Taylor, mm-hmm. top interview. Oh, thank you. I thought that was a really <laughs> uh, information-filled uh, 12 minutes or so. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, listeners actually... I had a lot to do with all the information coming in, yeah. <laughs> well, you asked the questions, right? True. I mean, we've done a lot more guests, a lot more interviews on mm-hmm. this show recently. I'd be curious to know what listeners think. Do they like hearing a different voice? We, we've kind of got the theory that it can't just be me and Taylor all the time. People yeah. might get sick of just us. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to get some feedback. Contact at TotalSockShow.com if you like the guests we're having or if you have a different opinion. Sounds good um, to me. But let's pick up on some of, some of what Taylor said. Sure. Let's start with maybe the teams that didn't make it to the quarterfinals. Mm-hmm. Right? So yeah. the teams that are out after the group stage are... Gabon. Yep. Algeria. And Ivory Coast would I mean, be the three big ones. The three big names that you maybe would have expected. Unless to you through. want to talk about Zimbabwe. I do not. Okay. Then we'll talk about it. Let's start with Ivory Coast. Because, <laughs> it's only because, you know, full disclosure, I haven't researched Zimbabwe. True. Um, <laughs> but I was really surprised because, again, it, I did have that kind of assumption that it's the Ivory Coast. They've got all these huge big name players. Mm-hmm. Of course, they're going to go far in this tournament. So when they didn't, then I was like, oh, okay, they must be missing a bunch of players. They are missing the Torre brothers. Jervinho, as he said, is injured. Mm-hmm. But that's still that front three that they had was like Wilfred Boney. Salma uh, Kalu. And Wilfred Zaha. They yeah. still have like Eric Bai in defense. Yes. They've got Serge Aurier in defense. So you do, it does feel like they probably should have done better. It maybe points yeah. to transition, maybe some instability within the team. I would say um, I looked at the, the central midfield mm-hmm. uh, that played, and I didn't really recognize there is any that. of those three players. That yeah. may be my failing. But then also when I saw... Um, <laughs> didn't Taimor reference the goal that Morocco scored? Yeah. I think he called it the goal of the tournament so far. It was um, Aliou. Mm-hmm. Um, when you watch that, it is definitely an Ivory Coast team doing a bad job of trying to pass through Morocco, and Morocco just break, and, yeah. they, and they break Ivory Coast <laughs> <laughs> to score. I mean, it's a great goal because it's from outside the box in the end, but it's all about the counter, really, and how Ivory Coast let that happen. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so then you start to see why that would happen, and then obviously the situation... Uh, political situation in Gabon and the fact that it seems like maybe people just weren't around that team. It does sound like from everything I've heard about them in previous iterations of the tournament, it was a lot of support kind of galvanized the team. And when you don't have that backing, especially on home soil, you can probably feel that lack of atmosphere. And rather than have like no effect, which would be like, ah, no one's here, but we can still play. If you're that host country that's fed off of it before, Mm -hmm. it probably has very much the opposite effect. I wish it it inhibits performance. I wish I'd known all this before I predicted Obama Yang would be top scorer in the (laughs) African Cup of Nations. That was one of my predictions for 2017. I do. I did notice. Right. So you could you could phrase this another way. Like if you look at Gabon's results, Mm -hmm. um, Aubameyang scored twice in the group stage. Um, Gabon were unbeaten, Mm -hmm. and they got a clean sheet against Cameroon. If I told you those three things, you'd You'd expect them to be out of the group. Probably went through, right? Mm -hmm. But they did not. But in the end, they did not. (laughs) And he will not be finishing a top score. So that's one prediction you won't be getting. It was three ties, right? Three ties, no wins, not enough to go Mm -hmm. through. Yeah. Um, Algeria. Um, Temud. I think he said that Riyad Mahrez. Was Riyad Mahrez? Yep. <laughs> Did his Riyad Mahrez thing? But essentially the field was against him and the rest of his team didn't contribute either. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and that, that again, it's similar to Ivory Coast where you've got strong attackers. You've yeah. got Islam Samani in there yeah. too. Possibly about to move to China for £40 million is what I just read. That's insane. Yeah. That's insane. But I you think they're going to spend that Diego Costa money might go to uh, Slimani. The, it's a Leicester striker if people aren't familiar okay. with Slimani. Yeah, I was going to say, Di- say the Diego Costa what now, huh? But now I'm with you. Now <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, but you'd expect that kind of connection to be there because they're mm-hmm. with Leicester. Um, but it sounds like maybe there was just wasn't much consistency aside from uh, those two. There's also Gediora, uh, the Watford player, who right. I know from his Wolves days. I was a, kind of a big fan of him when he mm-hmm. briefly played for Wolves before leaving us. So he's you got three Premier League forwards. Seems like there's a lot of like tertiary Wolves players <laughs> sort of involved <laughs> yeah. with some of these teams. Well, Wolves, have, there's been a churn at Wolves. There's been a lot of players have uh, come through Molyneux in the past few that's, years. That's the adjective you want to describe your club. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at the teams that did get out of the group. So we've got quarterfinals, four <laughs> yes. matches. Uh, the first one that I have on my piece of paper is Burkina Faso versus Tunisia. Yes, this is on Saturday. It's 11 a.m. Eastern in mm. the United States. It's going to be on Be In Sports. Mm-hmm. I want to call Burkina Faso um, a team that you, when you look at these quarterfinals, you're like, huh, they made it. I think there's, there's <laughs> a, I would say, m- like the majority of the teams that made it to the knockout round, speaking for me personally, because yeah. I don't follow African football probably as much as I should. A lot of these teams, like, oh, they're a surprise upstart. And in reality, the, a lot of these teams have been performing, have been kind of building their rosters, building to this tournament yep. and that's why they are where they are Burkina Faso runners up in 2013 that's worth I, remembering so I would not have known that till I did my, my remembering and research mm-hmm. by which I mean looking at the internet <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you this about mm-hmm. Burkina Faso yep. a little bit of research on them the man to watch Bertrand Traore so they have three Traores mm-hmm. the man to watch is Bertrand Traore he is 21 years old he's a Chelsea player on loan at Ajax right so you, they don't even sent him to Vitesse Arnhem mm-hmm. sent him to Ajax um, you're going to see him on the right wing uh, cutting in with his left foot basically being the Burkina Faso Iron Robin 
I like it. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and again, there are three Trevor Rays. You'll know him because he's the one that they feed the ball to as often as possible. Mm-hmm. He's also got kind of a, he lifts his hair up. So he's got kind of a, I don't know if it's spiky or if he's got it like pulled back and up. But essentially, you can't miss him. Okay, I like it. <laughs> uh, for Tunisia, who I think I think are probably going to try it out in a four two three one. It. I, I know it's been described a little bit as like they're kind of pragmatic and they're not the most exciting team. I think that's because you probably don't know a lot of the names on the roster. But if you watch the highlights and you watch some of their games, they're a very chaotic team in terms of they're very attacking, they're very open going forward. They're also pretty open at the back, which is why you get open results. Both ways. Yeah, you get results like four to two against Zimbabwe. Okay. Um, the player that I would say you should pay attention to is Yusef uh, Msakani, is how I'm going to say you pronounce that. Could be wrong. Mm-hmm. Plays in cutter. He's playing up top for them, although I think he's naturally a midfielder. But a lot of their goals have come from kind of attacking, free-flowing, quick passing, one-twos, wall passes, and, and well-taking goals as well. Some deflections, but it's still very <laughs> exciting uh, soccer. So that's And he's the man who seems to be very much involved in those attacks. You said they were open at the back as mm-hmm. well, right? Is that just a committed men forward? Because I'm kind of optimistic for Burkina Faso because some of the goals I've mm-hmm. seen from them in this tournament have been, I want to call them forced errors like mm-hmm. they've made the opposition make terrible terrible errors like yeah. Guinea-Bissau scored a, a really quite comical own goal mm-hmm. where the, a defender headed it past his own keeper and the defender tried to slide tackle it off the line but it hit the post and went yeah. in um, there was a free kick that Burkina Faso took in another game can't remember who it was against and sort of the goalkeeper parried it down it was like a scramble in the box and they scored it mm-hmm. so I'm thinking if Tunisia are a little bit open Burkina Faso are forcing some errors that could be how a goal comes yeah I think it's it, but from what I've seen it's it's less about like the forcing of errors and more about over committing in defence because they've committed so many people forward. The one, uh, it's, I think, Nag- Naguez. I, again, forgive my pronunciation, but is the attacking right back. You can apologize every time you name a player. <laughs> For at least Tunisia, <laughs> yes. Uh, he's an attacking right back, but they play a 4-2-3-1. It's not like they've got a lot of defensive cover. Yeah. So there's a lot of, of, of stuff that I've seen where he would be bombing up the wing and getting involved in the attack and then bombing right back down to try to cover. <laughs> and so like one of uh, one of Zimbabwe's goals come because three different players dive in, and the player just cuts back, and they all go flying out of picture, and then he, <laughs> and then he shoots. I mean, it's really well done by the Zimbabwe striker, but you can have that kind of overcommitting, yeah. where I do think, yeah, if Burkina Faso commit numbers forward and do so quickly, uh, Tunisia could be in trouble. All right, can we talk the other game on Saturday is... Egypt, Morocco. Mm-hmm. All right, so Egypt, I think I heard Jonathan Wilson say, and if anyone's not familiar with Jonathan Wilson, Guardian journalist, who I think he goes to every Africa Cup of Nations, kind of has a handle on what's going on, right? Yep. I think they were his favorites to win this tournament. I think based on what he's seen from Egypt in the past and Cup of Nations tournaments of years gone by in which Egypt won by kind of grinding out results, having one or two outstanding performances and then the rest being very consistent performances. 2006, 2008, 2010, Mm -hmm. Abu Trika at the center of it all. And so I think that's what he's kind of looking at here. And and then as uh, Tamor pointed out, it's not great conditions. It's been raining and really hot. So you don't get like the most attractive soccer as a result. You kind of, it goes back to my old coach's quote of uh, crap field, crap, condi- crap conditions, crap results. <laughs> Feels like that a little bit. And so the team that can maybe kind of find a way to deal with you that can the use best. a different word, but okay. Yeah, I think you might have. <laughs> um, but the team that can find a way to deal with those conditions is the one that's going to win. And that kind of goes down to grinding out the results. And it does seem like Egypt are more than capable of doing that. It also helps if you have uh, Mohamed Salah. Yep, that, so, doesn't, that doesn't hurt. Famously, I can't remember if you and Timo, uh, Timo talked about this, mm-hmm. but Mohamed Salah scored that free kick for Egypt against Ghana right. in, I think, the final group stage game. Mm-hmm. That was the goal when 1-0 put Egypt top of the group above Ghana, right? They right. won the group by one point. They did. This free kick, um, I've, uh, you've seen this? Mm-hmm. I've seen this. It's not bendy. It's kind of just like a straight arrow left foot to the top left corner. It's, it's like it's on a rope and it's just someone's just pulled it in. It does. It <laughs> doesn't move at all. So it really does point line. to like, is the wall really poorly set up? I can't figure out what it is. But yeah, it's basically he takes it from what would be his right hand side of the mm-hmm. top of the box. Yeah, like center it, right, right. Hits it to the left hand side for him. And yeah, just hits it side netting, but hits it real hard. I didn't think about bad wall setup. Is that yeah, because if the ball doesn't move at all, it does seem like the goalkeeper should be in a position to deal with that. Now, yeah. there is some screening. There's a lot of people in front of uh, the goalkeeper when that shot is taken. But still, you'd expect a little bit better. But as a result, it means Egypt go through top. That's why Egypt playing Morocco. And, uh, and then you have Ghana playing DR Congo. More on that in a moment. One more mention for Egypt. Mm-hmm. Their goalkeeper is the goalkeeper from those 2006, 2008, 2010 tournaments. Mm-hmm. He has not conceded a goal yet. I know it's not all him, right? That's obviously mm-hmm. the defensive setup in front of him. Um, um, El Hamadi, uh, El Hadadi, so El Hadar. Sorry, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, now who's pro- apologizing for pronunciation? What's up? <laughs> El Hadari, 44 years old, 
in goal. That's impressive. Yeah, it is. So just keep an eye on him. Didn't you explain it to me as like that team that was winning all of the cup, Cups of Nations uh, previously, that he was playing for those teams too, and, yeah. he, and he wasn't young then, is I believe <laughs> yeah. what you said. And now he's 44. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, he would have been in his 30s then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the other name, obviously, to mention when it comes to Egypt is Mohamed Elneny, the Arsenal midfielder. He is kind of anchoring that uh, defensive of midfield yeah. for Egypt and and use that physicality to his advantage because in that Ghana game, again, it's wet, it's hot. It's a lot of foul, free kick, foul, free kick, back and forth, almost <laughs> like a tennis match. So you kind of have to have that physicality, and he is definitely bringing that for Egypt. All right, so that's the other Saturday game. Mm-hmm. Moving on to Sunday, the 11 a.m. game is Senegal versus Cameroon. Mm-hmm. So if I remember from your conversation, um, basically um, Senegal favorites to win this. Jonathan mm-hmm. Wilson may say Egypt, but Tamor and Taylor both mm-hmm. say Senegal to win. Uh, it's between Egypt and Senegal. For okay, me, I think so, um, and I think I wouldn't mind Senegal just because it, they have those kind of attacking names that are exciting. You've got the, na- the name that everybody knows, which is Sadio Mane. That would be the one. Yeah, and I really mm-hmm. thought, oh, maybe he's just doing all of this on his own. But then when you guys talked about they got loads of talent, I went and looked at mm-hmm. the roster, and oh my, oh my. Okay, who, it's who, a galaxy of stars. Who excites you? Who excites <laughs> you on there? Because um, so, I've got mine. So obviously Sadio Mane, mm-hmm. very exciting. Liverpool fans will know exactly what he's all about. Yep. Um, the guy that caught my eye, twenty-one-year-old uh, Keita Balde Diaw. Mm-hmm. He is. Um, he plays for Lazio. Right. He's only twenty-one years old. He is banging in goals for Lazio. Mm-hmm. He's going to pop up on the right or left wing, I think, for Senegal from what I've seen. Um, this guy is fast in that, that way that not just like um, at a sprint he's fast. Like he can be standing or just waiting with the ball and then burst past mm-hmm. you and he's gone, right? He is strong. I've seen him back to goal, hold people off and then turn them. And he's got sort of those sh- the bit of showmanship that is also kind of fun to see, like the no-look pass mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So he's going to be, he's going to be a dangerous, dangerous player. Mm-hmm. You look at their midfield. You look at their midfield, they have not only uh, Guy, the Everton defensive midfielder, there's uh, the other, the big guy who plays for West Ham, um, uh, Chet Quixote. Mm-hmm. Quixote, another massive midfielder. So they've got big guy, little guy, central midfield, ready to bust you up in central midfield. And then um, you mentioned uh, Bailly for Ivory Coast, mm-hmm. uh, like sort of Manchester United defender. Another player that I believe United are after in the summer and Chelsea are after as well. Napoli defender Koulibaly. Mm-hmm. £50 million, pounds, I believe, was the bid. He didn't leave, he stayed at Napoli. Watching this guy in action is a thing of beauty. He looks like he should be clumsy and knock you over, but instead he's graceful. Comes in big, strong and fast, but then leaves with the ball. Mm -hmm. And then the one that I'm very excited about, uh, just because of my time in Turkey, is Musa So. He of the overhead kick uh, (laughs) compilation. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Uh, I guess he's probably not going to be starting. He started the last game, but that was because Senegal were resting players. So it seems like maybe he'll come in if they're chasing a goal. But he is prone to the dramatic and the dramatic flair at that. So if he's on the field, you should be watching him because it could be uh, fireworks. What a thing to be known for, overhead kicks. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> worth being known for. And then if you look at Cameroon, as uh, Tamor pointed out, it's essentially a Cameroon team that doesn't have the familiar names that maybe it has in the years past, looking particularly in the direction of Samuel Eto'o. Mm-hmm. Uh, Samuel Eto'o not there, Alex Song also not there. So instead, you've got names like Clinton and G is the one that we Four both Spurs had. Spurs player, occasionally. Yeah, I think he's on, <laughs> uh, yeah, still with Spurs, but on low. Uh, okay. in France and then the only other one that I knew like off the top of my head was Ambrose Ayungo the left back for Montreal this is interesting because I remember uh, Cameroon teams of the past I think mm-hmm. I'm thinking of 2010 when there was like, too much focus on Samuel Eto'o yeah. like it's not always a good thing to have one no, super famous player mm-hmm. right Yeah. alright so Senegal Cameroon is Sunday at 11am yep. in sports the final quarter final game uh, DR Congo Democratic yep. Republic of Congo mm-hmm. versus Ghana yeah alright you want to talk some Ghana? Sure. Because that seems to be the story that most people are focusing on is that Asamo Jian, mm-hmm. the Ghana's goal scorer, is um, either definitely out or more than likely out of this game with an injury, likely possibly out. out of the tournament. Subbed out in the 45th minute of their game against Egypt, yeah. So what does that mean for Ghana? Because I kind of think of Ghana as having enough talent that they can handle it without Jian, right? Mm-hmm. you still got uh, Andre Ayew. Yep. you still got Jordan Ayew. Jordan Ayew would got... be, I think, the one who probably comes in in the absence of Asamo Jian. Oh, because he's the one that plays centre forward, right? Yep. And then you've mm-hmm. got, but you've got Matsu on the wing, right? Mm-hmm. Always dangerous. And Ayu... Atsu. Atsu. Atsu, Christian sorry, Atsu. Mm-hmm. Atsu on the wing. Yeah. Uh, no, I think he's still another one who's still a Chelsea player who's just been sent out on loan. Their, their loan gracious. list is um, horrifically good. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and that's the team that is coached by former Chelsea legend. Avram Grant. Of course. Yes, and, and he's grown the beard. He strong, looks good. Strong use of the word legend there. The beard looks good on him, i got to say. And he's, and he's, he's kind of uh, his preferred dress that I remember from him, the kind of relaxed casual as opposed mm-hmm. to like the, you know, the fully tailored suit. Yeah. It suits him relaxed now. Casual. It suits him in a tropical, super hot, super rainy environment. Yeah. So he looked, he looked 
uh, good on the sad line. I'll say that about <laughs> Uncle Abby. Yeah. And then what do we know about Congo? What do we know about the Democratic Republic of Congo? I did not know much until I started researching them. I can tell you that Junior Kabanga is the man that has, has or Kabananga, I believe, has ruined uh, your prediction because he <laughs> is currently the top goal scorer in the tournament with three goals, plays for Astana. So Gomian can't catch him. I uh, know. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Plays for Astana in, I believe, Kazakhstan, uh, but he's the one who's been getting the goals. The player that you probably want to pay attention to, though, is their number 10, Niskins Cabano. Niskins? <laughs> Niskins. Named after Johan Niskins, the, the Dutch legend, I'll say. Uh-huh. Again, yeah, yeah, just handing out legend left and right. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, I guess his father was a big fan. Uh, Niskins Cabano was born in France, uh, but I guess maybe there was some crossover there as to why his dad loved Johan Niskins. Are you saying he's the one to look out for just because of that name? Or no, he, uh, he is their, their kind of very creative playmaker, and he is the guy who, like, if you go back and look at some of their highlights, he scored a beautiful, that sort of layoff, runs 15 yards, and then shoots it from 25 out, and it rockets in. Okay. So he's kind of the midfield creator, the midfield dynamo, as it were, in that, again, that four two three one that they're probably going to be going with. All right, so that's basically we've just done a quick guide. That wasn't necessarily the plan, but we've done a quick guide to yeah. the Africa Cup of Nations quarterfinals, which are all this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, you can catch them on B in Sports. You can also probably find them online if yep. you if you try hard enough, including online at B in Sport. Yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> B in Sports Connect, I believe mm-hmm. they call it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can't promise like full reviews of every game, but we'll definitely pay attention to what happens in the quarterfinals, and we'll include some form of report in the future. Hopefully, we'll have some like beautiful goals to uh, to break down on next week's Total Soccer Show. Sounds like a plan. Final thing on today's show, Taylor, the TSS Scouting Network, where we track talented young players around the world. Mm -hmm. And we'll start off with a gentleman from the DR Congo, though that's not who he's representing. Uh, First (laughs) report comes from Eric Radist about Jonathan Lecco, 17-year-old forward, born in DR Congo, playing for uh, England at youth level and occasionally for West Brom, Uh though not frequently. That's not bad for a 17-year-old, though. No. Uh, Young Jonathan has been squeezed out of West Brom's matchday squad, but continues to shred Premier League 2 defenses (laughs) with his pace and directness. He was the Premier League to player of the month for December and there are now rumblings of a loan to a championship squad in order to get him some first team minutes next up Guy Yedwab is sc- scouting Serge Gnabry the 21 year old former Arsenal player which mm-hmm. is I believe why Guy wanted to scout him uh, is German midfielder playing for Werder Bremen okay Guy says Serge Gnabry continues to be linked with everyone in Europe <laughs> <laughs> Bayern's Karl-Heinz Rummenigge confirmed that the youngster was on their radar but a move anytime soon was unlikely meanwhile rumours got stirred that Gnabry would go to Chelsea or Arsenal in the sense that when asked would you be open to Chelsea or Arsenal transferring you in Gnabry responded well at the moment I'm trying to give everything to Werder which prompted the headline, Serge Gnabry hints at sensational return to Arsenal. <laughs> of course. Oh, January. Yep. It also seems pretty clear that Lazio um, have Gnabry as a target if the aforementioned Kaita. Mm-hmm. Did you know this was coming when we. Mm-hmm. Okay. If the aforementioned Kaita leaves. All that said, Gnabry's Instagram is full of videos of him dancing with other players and sharing inside jokes with his green and white teammates, and he seems to have really found his place on and off the field. There we are. So we shall see, but it seems like rumors will persist. Um, One player about whom rumors may no longer persist is Andreas Christensen, who's scouted by Michael Fisk. Uh, Christensen would be that 20-year-old Danish center back for Gladbach currently, though not uh, for much longer. Uh, Gladbach Sporting Director Max Eberl confirmed that Andreas will return to Chelsea this summer after his loan expires. Uh, Eberl added, uh, the agreement is that Andreas will return to Chelsea this summer. It has been an outstanding deal for all parties involved. Uh, Christensen went the full 90 minutes and started the Rukrund, that is horrible pronunciation as well, <laughs> uh, which is the back half of the Bundesliga season. They started with a clean sheet at BM, uh, as BMG drew Darmstadt nil-nil on Saturday afternoon. Oh, that's Darmstadt before they had Terence Boyd though. That yeah, that was all the big change. difference. Yep. That could all change when Terence Boyd is banging Indeed. headers in. Of right? course. That's the big difference. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, if this is a no. Uh, US, US national team mm-hmm. player, 14 caps. Terence Boyd has left uh, RB Leipzig mm-hmm. on a permanent basis to join Darmstadt in their Bundesliga relegation battle. So we'll get possibly get to see Boyd in action with a team other than RB Leipzig's U14s. Possibly, hopefully, maybe. <laughs> was, I can't remember what it was. I was trying to find that video again for somebody, but, uh, but I couldn't. But hopefully it's still out there, the one of him training with the young teenagers. <laughs> and not being particularly great with them. That's okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you to Eric, to Guy, and to Michael for today day's scouting reports if you want to get in on the tss scouting network action and support the total soccer show you can do so at totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe uh thank you once again to everybody who has done so all right taylor rockwell thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. right back at you buddy listeners thank you for listening we'll be back on friday with our usa v serbia preview.